This is, I think, part three of the Body Builds the Body. Uh, for those who are just joining us, each year we uh, send out a little survey to members of the body asking them um, you know, what they want to praise God for in preparation for a retreat where we spend a longer time praising God. Um, and then uh, how they've grown and how the body helps. And the reason we do that is uh, we want to remind people that are supposed to grow. We want to know what's working so we can do more of it, uh, what's not working so we can do less of it, and uh, what ideas and suggestions that people have to help us uh, grow together. And uh, this is the fruit of that. In the past weeks we shared praises. Last uh, time we met on this topic, uh, I shared probably half of how people have grown uh, and now we're going to go back to the second half. Uh, the basic principle is that uh, God gave gifted men, pastor teachers, and their job is not to do the work of ministry, but to equip the saints for the work of ministry, teaching them uh, you know, what God said, help them understand it, how to study it, how to apply it. Uh, and then the uh, body is supposed to build the body uh, when they reach a certain level of maturity. And then by speaking the truth in love, sharing truth with each other, uh, the body grows. Uh, in order for that to happen, people have to be connected to Christ as the head, and then they're joined together uh, with other members of the body. And the body causes the growth of the body to edify or build up itself in love. So uh, the big command is love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And that really should be what church is all about. Love is loyalty um, as well. So this is all uh, praises. You know, the praises were awesome. Um, I wish we could have recorded, well, I did record this part, but I wish we could have recorded our praise time today. Um, it basically makes this sermon superfluous. Um, had we recorded it, I would stop getting requests to do how God can meet emotional needs. I'd be able to just say, hey, look at this one. Uh, real life examples. Uh, I don't have to go look up little poems and stories that keep your interest because uh, it's real life stuff. So we're in this section. Uh, how have you grown as a fruitful, reproductive disciple, which is a follower of Jesus Christ, and what has helped or hindered? Um, and I took some of the results, got people's permission, and they're anonymous. Um, and shared excerpts that I thought would be uh, beneficial. And it's just listening to the praises today, and I've been thinking through the past week as reviewing these, uh, it's actually giving me a desire to uh, resurrect uh, my desire to do the catacomb church uh, so other believers can kind of repeat this uh, in their own environments. So uh, we had people uh, going through trials and growth and um, I think this is it. Yeah, we're going to do this one. Kind of left off. I'm going to get a running start on D. Uh, come on, get up here. No. Okay. Up, up, up. And D. Okay. So uh, this one kind of goes together with E. Uh, as the person you know is interacting with body members uh, over the years, they um, you know and doing these evaluations and their time in the scripture, the Holy Spirit kind of brought needs to mind. And uh, here is one of the ways the person grew, uh, the spirit of God's at work in us to will and to do God's good pleasure. So he gives you the desire as well as the grace and power to do what pleases God and pleasing God should be like top of our priority list. Uh, so what they said was becoming more mature in managing emotions is one of the ways that they grew and developing character uh, character is basically something that is gained by uh, doing what you don't want to do. It's that simple. This, I have a series on a couple sermons on uh, truthbase.net on uh, the, the basic character traits, virtues, and how it was developed. And as we're talking with someone this week about uh, an elite uh, private school education they had and uh, how it differed from what happens today, but it also differs from what happened historically where character was the main emphasis um, and the person said you know i went to a whole bunch of chapels but i, I there's nothing i ever remembered and uh it, was, it wasn't something to relate to but essence of character is you do something you don't naturally want to do 
it's also the essence of arete, which is the Greek virtue of excellence, their highest virtue. And that was, uh, instead of following your desires, you basically sublimated them to follow your objectives uh, for, for the better way. And that's the word for excellence. So this person became more mature in managing their emotions, as opposed to man the emotions managing them, and developing character, such as patience, uh, it's long-suffering in the face of provocation, anger, um, frustration, by redirecting them to seeking God's perspective. And like so much of the Christian life is looking at things from God's perspective rather than your own perspective or the world's perspective, which is very common to your perspective, which ultimately is Satan's perspective. So everything's under the sway of the evil one. Last verse in 1 John chapter 5. So we did... Oh. Sorry. Um, can you put yourself in full screen? Full screen. I am in full screen. Oh, no? Yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, the... Mm -hmm. Why is it... Because we can see a flashing red box. Oh, okay. But I think that's just the it's, new... It's the news uh, fast stone. Sorry. Yeah, this... Uh, they, they made me... Size it. Sorry. Um, so we see things from the wrong perspective. We need to see things from God's perspective, and that solves a lot of problems. Realizing he's in control, he is sovereign of the events that affect our world today. If you realize, yeah, God is at work. Uh, this, uh, nothing catches him by surprise. It's actually part of his plan. A little sidebar on that, you know, during the days of uh, the fall of Jerusalem, um, Habakkuk was lamenting the fact that God seemed to be letting evil run rampant in the nation of Israel. And God said, eh, Habakkuk, don't worry, I, I got a plan. Uh, I'm actually going to bring in ba Babylon to destroy my wicked people. And then Habakkuk is really <laughs> confused because, wait a minute, Babylon, they're w more wicked than we are. How can you use somebody more wicked than we are? How can you use evil uh, to deal with your people? And God says, hey, I know what I'm doing. Uh, the just, which is what you are, Habakkuk, shall live by faith, faith in that he knows what God is doing. Um, I don't think most people realize that part of their faith is believing God's promises besides believing that he died for your sins. So this person said uh, one of the things they grew in is trusting God and his timing and orchestration. That's like works all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose instead of using brute forcing their own way. Uh, wasting tons of time. I uh, covered this last week. Uh, those who care about pleasing God care about what God cares about, such as the spiritual welfare of people, instead of reacting to how they're being wronged or how things are not going to their plan. Um, and then we got Romans 8.28. Okay, now we go to this. That was another person. One of the things I uncovered last year and began tackling was a lack of emotional self-control. Um, similar theme. A couple of people are going through this, which is fantastic. Um, and this came about as discussions with X and observing myself. So I began to realize just how many of my actions were determined merely by how I felt in the moment. So we looked at false teachers uh, in a series on uh, uh, what was it? It was Jude. And uh, we came across this word, I think, lasciviousness, which basically means wanton caprice. And caprice is doing what you feel like doing. And wantonness is doing it without regard to you know, cost or benefit or destruction or what. <laughs> you just do what you feel like. And uh, that's our world. People have just been raised to do what you feel like. And uh, without how does it affect someone else? How does it affect your destiny? How does it affect God? Those questions don't enter in. It's a form of lust. Anyway, many of my actions were determined by just how I felt. This year, I've been working, look at it, like blood, sweat, and tears, on detaching my emotions from what I feel like doing in the moment and replacing it with what I think, note the contrast, God wants me to prioritize. That is arete. That is excellence. And it's also excellent that that is something that they are doing. Though I'm still in the process, uh, as we all are, of becoming more discerning in all decisions, big and small, 
I've continued reading a daily proverb close to every day in my quiet time. I picked this up again at the end of last year. It's been really profitable for keeping God's wisdom and principles in front of my face and at the forefront of my mind. Uh, you can do the proverb of the day, 31 days, 31 proverbs. Uh, you can actually look at Daily Truth Base, where I actually give you just an excerpt from the proverbs, and you just go through that every day and uh, get some more insights into what it means and how to apply it. Um, but the key thing is you want to keep God's wisdom and principles in the front of your face. Uh, God said, you know, bind these things uh, on your forefront of your thinking. Uh, they did it literally, uh, <laughs> kind of missing the fact that it's supposed to actually go through the forehead into the brain and affect what you do. <laughs> because if you ask, why do we do that? It's because we wanted to. That's what we were looking at. That's what we were thinking of. So you got to be careful what you fill your mind with. I look at this practice of uh, doing the proverb of the day. At, 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 at that consistent intake as a reservoir helps me draw for, from it for help uh, to daily to direct daily decisions rather than moving on to the next thing on a whim. Something I discovered I have many of. Whimsy, yeah, lots of whims. Um, then instead of my emotions directing what I do, I find out more and more that what I'm doing directs my emotions. Yeah, that's amazing that you can, uh, it's easier to uh, act your way into a feeling than feel your way into an action. Uh, so it's like it's really great growth. Uh, this is helpful when I have to do things that I have a more innate resistance to doing. Okay, innate resistance. What's an innate resistance? Well, we have a set of values that we've acquired, and they kind of direct what we do. Uh, we have an innate uh, resistance to dying to self because self-preservation is you know something we're hardwired to do. Uh, it takes something supernatural to help us you know, kind of be willing to sacrifice ourselves for. Uh, a higher objective or the benefit of others or God's glory. So this person's particular innate resistances were to interacting over perceived conflict, doing monotonous chores. Amen. Uh, and the reason they have uh, this has been helpful is I can recognize what's best in the moment and ask God for power assist to get it done and then proceed knowing that God is pleased. All three of those things. I'd like to spend more time in that, but I'll never get to the end of this thing. Um, but you, you got to recognize uh, what's going on. It's like it's called being in the light. And people, when, when Jesus told Paul, you know, I want you to send you to the Gentiles, he said, I want you to turn them um, from darkness to light. And look at my Christmas sermon on, on light. That's kind of what Jesus came to do. And then in telling Paul this commission to him, he said to, to turn them from the power of God, I mean, power of Satan to the power of God, uh, to let them obtain forgiveness of sins and inheritance among those who are sanctified. But people are stumbling around in the dark, and they have to be moved to the light. And if Satan keep us in the dark, he is happy. God wants us to walk in the light, and walking in the light is the basis of fellowship with one another. If we walk in the light as seed is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And where we mess up the blood of Jesus cleanses us from our sin. So we need to be able to recognize what's best. Uh, you need a biblical set of values. Uh, like faithfulness is higher than our comfort. Faithfulness is even higher than our life. Uh, you know, that's, okay, I have to pass on the rest of these. But, oh yeah, I can do this one. The thing that keeps you going is knowing that God is pleased and that it's a good thing to please God. Um, yeah, that's a thing. And Colossians 1 tells you kind of how to please God if you're a little in doubt. The next uh, part says that there were two Proverbs in particular that they found uh, themselves dwelling on. Oh, that's a good thing. You want to dwell on these things, meditate on them, meditate and use, revolving it in your mind and my take on that is thinking through the implications for applications. You know, where does this apply? And here we have a great example of that. A wise woman builds her house, foolish woman tears her down with her own hands. Um, are you building or you know, what are you building? And uh, you want to avoid tearing things down. Uh, 21.5, the plans of the diligent surely lead to plenty. Everyone who is hasty surely leads to poverty. Plenty and poverty, what's the difference? One person is diligent and they make plans. The other one does 
ah, whatever they want. It's like hasty. You, know, you just rush into stuff because you feel like doing it. And that results in something you don't want. So planning is a thing. Um, last week's sermon at the beginning of the year, yearly evaluation, uh, I encouraged you to evaluate um, your, air, your life in the areas that God is going to judge you on and uh, plan to fulfill two great commands. I like how you plan to fulfill loving God and loving your neighbor, uh, as well as how do you plan on obeying the other stuff God uh, requires of us. So this person said, I've tried to ask myself more consistently, what is this action building towards? Am I, am, am I following through on things I've begun building? Oh yeah, right. It's easy to start, it's tough to finish. Uh, but some people are saying, oh, finish is no problem. It's there, I just do it. Uh, those people are often starting the wrong thing, but um, you need both uh, some figuring out what God wants you to do and then the follow through on it. Uh, am I doing something foolish that is tearing down the work I've already done? Yeah. Wow, sometimes we basically did wipe out the, the good progress we've made because we've gone back to old habits. Am I rushing into something? Am I taking time to really think through or consider and understand uh, if something or how I'm going about it is really best? Okay, what they have in here is a little definition of wisdom. Wisdom is choosing the right objective and then the right means of obtaining it. So it's all over Daily Truth Base and every time I look at Proverbs. Uh, what's the objective? And then are you following the right way to get that objective? Two right things you got to know. Not just what to do, but how to do it. And they're seeking to understand, this is beautiful, if it's really best, and you know the good is often the enemy of the best. Uh, something that has really helped frame these questions are all the sermons that we've had over the past several months on the glory of the kingdom. I still don't fully understand how that works, but it is the motivation that you, know, you need to live in light of what's going to happen in the future, which is Lord Jesus coming back and examining what you've done. Another helpful resource uh, for growth this year, same person, was some dying to self. Ooh, painful, ouch, hurt. In identifying and working on changing some really common, human, everybody does it, self-centered values. Uh, so this week I found out that one of my favorite comedians, uh, Rowan Atkinson, uh, who uh, is also known as Mr. Bean, uh, is no longer doing his show. I didn't read, or his series, I didn't read um, why yet, but I started grieving. Um, and, and I was thinking, oh, he must be doing something to offend someone. But what Mr. Bean does is he typifies with brilliance a character who basically just lives for himself, oblivious to everybody else. And, and he just, it, 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 he portrays this with, with pure genius. Um, and the reason it's kind of funny is because we all relate to being self-centered. Of course, we're not as bad as he is, so I guess we're okay. Um, but that's really what makes relationships bad, uh, what makes you incapable of worshiping God. You're supposed to be God-centered, not self-centered. Uh, as a member of a body, you're supposed to be other-centered, not self-centered. Uh, and self-centeredness is just like, not good. I shouldn't have to tell you that, but some people maybe need that. Uh, I think that this, changing my self-centered values, uh, coupled with increased emotional self-control, has helped me to be more pleasing to God in my interactions with others. Of course it's going to help you. That is really a great thing because self-centered versus other-centered. Here's a quick, easy quiz question. Uh, was Jesus self-centered or other-centered? Oh, wow, that's tough. Uh, but based on what you've just been saying, I'm going to say other-centered. Right, okay, where do you know that from? How about Philippians 2? Consider one another as more important than yourselves, their interest ahead of your interest. But, but what about my interest? Well, the royal law of liberty in James is that uh, God's love meets your needs, so you are free to meet the needs of others, and you don't have to use them to meet your needs. And that's what most relationships are built on. You mutually use each other until it becomes inequitable and then bad. But here this person has actually really nailed it. 
they're thinking about how can I be more pleasing to God and then they narrow, narrow it down to a specific area of my interactions with others so you walk away from the interaction it was God pleased with what I said with what I did uh, you know why did I say that um, so you, you need to be reflecting on this and one of the advantages of the disadvantages of COVID is that you have more time to reflect and uh, I've seen this in broader society as a whole. I've seen it in articles I've read about the benefits of COVID. Um, and obviously in the body, uh, people are praising God for having just more time to think through this and being have some of our normal amusements and diversions and escapisms cut off. We you know, can actually reflect on what does God want? Um, so I think there are actually good things that come out of this apparent tragedy. It's not perfect yet, um, but it's not going to be perfect until we get to heaven. Uh, but a lot of people-pleasing, unarticulated expectations. What's that? That means you have expectations of other, but you, others, but you haven't gone through and communicated what those are. Communication is a key to a lot of relationships. Communication means to have in common. Uh, if it's in your head and not on the table so the two of you can look at it, then it's an unarticulated expectation and it's illegitimate because you can't be expecting people to know what you're thinking and then blame them for not knowing it. Unless, of course, you're married. And that often happens like that. Um, you should know what I'm thinking. Um, but I guessed wrong. Should have guessed right. All right. Uh, so other selfish things, like so basically is that a lot of unarticulated expect self people pleasing articulate expressions and other selfish thinking gets in the way of hearing others and simply trying to meet needs is clearing up okay so this is still the same person and th this is unbelievable well i think it's it, it's it's unbelievable that this is, this happens it should happen all over the place but it is so rare x that's another member of the body uh was not moi gave me a set of more structured questions to answer as an aid in this area. It doesn't get much more practical than this. And this set is particularly great because a member of the body um, who developed the relationship with God is now helping the, another member of the body in, in a way that is uh, just really suited to their need and has borne the appropriate fruit. And the body has grown as a result. So they went through the paradigm, which I mentioned in, some, in the scripture a number of times. You need to put off, be renewed, and put on. And if you don't put off before you put on, you're kind of basically, uh, you know, putting on a clean t-shirt on a dirty body and thinking that you smell nice, but you still stink. So what are you supposed to put off? So the thing that you need to put off is what the action is caused by a value cause and effect this is the basic of logical thought uh, i discovered in conversations with people that this isn't a thing uh, for everyone uh, cause and effect it's the uh, el essence of logic is that uh, x causes y um, and one of the tests for truth is logical consistency that are, are there consistent causes and effects in the argumentation so if we have an action why do we do that uh because i wanted to okay want is value why did you want that because my value system says that it's better for me to do that than not do it therefore i did it okay but if what you did isn't really ultimately in your best interest why are you doing it oh i didn't know it wasn't in my best interest of course, it takes people sometimes years to get to that oh moment. So you got to put off both the action and the value. So here's how the person uh, elaborated on this for the person who wrote this. Locate the scripture to back up what God thinks about this action and the wrong value. I remember when I uh, first started teaching, uh, I did a sermon on some of the ba basics of the faith. And I did the one on sin. So I always ask myself, uh, what don't people know about this topic? And I'm there typing. I still remember the keyboard I was using when I was typing out this thought. And I said, wow, 
that's really true. The point that I had to make was that sin is bad. And I had to make that point because I realized people don't believe sin is bad. They, it's, it's like, wow, it's unbelievable. You look at the scriptures, you constantly see consequences of sin. The reason we die is because of sin. The reason we're not you know, clothed with glory is because of sin. The reason work is hard is because of sin. The reason we have interpersonal conflict is because of sin. You know, sin gives us all the things that we don't like. And Satan deceives us into thinking that sin is good. And we gullibly buy it because we look at his things from his perspective rather than God's perspective. Okay, so look at Kate's scripture to see what God thinks about this action and the wrong value behind it. Then locate scripture to back up what God wants the new thing to be. What is rewardable? What is holy? What is Christ-like? We're supposed to be holy as God is holy. Uh, we're supposed to uh, you know, follow Paul as he follows Christ. We're supposed to imitate Christ. Walk in love as God, as Christ does. So that's the renewing is you basically change your values, but th this person really rooted it in scripture. And then, after we've done a little study, <clears throat> what are we going to put on? We're going to put on the new action. X action, which is the bad one up here, is going to be replaced by Y action, new thing, which is caused by new value. If you do not change your values, people, you will always revert back to the old thing. Or you'll become a legalistic hypocrite. You're just doing it when people are looking. You're not doing it because God has worked in your heart to the truth. So that the, you know when you start making your decisions, heart is where your decisions are made. And they actually, your conscience also resides there. And there's this little dynamic that goes on where you're faced with a decision. You think, should I do it? Uh, your conscience has the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. If you're regenerated, you have the Holy Spirit in there. And you, those, you know, the Holy Spirit kind of points out, this is, this is the one to do. And then you make that decision. Uh, but if you have all the wrong values in there and you just go by instinct, you're, you're no different from an animal. Animals operate on instinct. They don't think, they don't reflect. Uh, the Spirit of God doesn't work in them. So this is the decision. I'm going to do this new thing because I now believe this new thing. I did a series uh, half a dozen years ago or so on perception and performance. How you see things determines how you perform. I cover emotions and a bunch of stuff in there. Uh, I recommend it to you if this is an issue for you. So then the next thing they suggested is, well, what exactly does it look like uh, in your mind and in your action? So what's the thinking that's now going to reflect this new action? And what's the new action going to be? What will the result look like? And then let's get a target. How will you know the new thing is now the new you and not just a clean t-shirt put on over a stinking body all right that that that's brilliant and then we get something that comes out of uh, ain't gonna rain no more um, the, the basic uh sermon on um put to death the flesh and live in the spirit because reckon yourself dead to sin and alive to god one of the key steps in there on being dead and alive uh is after you align your thinking with god's word is you got to uh identify and visualize yourself doing the new action and that implants in our mind the uh new actions we're supposed to take so uh, this is com comes out of uh james i remember i was looking at how sin works and it said you know uh no, no one say you're tempted by you're tempted, you're tempted by god everyone is tempted when they're drawn away by their own lust and enticed so you have this desire it starts dangling its attractions in front of you and then when lust has conceived, it says the King James, but the version says embraced, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is finished or fully grown, brings forth death. So you cease a temptation, you embrace it, it becomes part of your life, it kills your spiritual life. Uh, and then I thought, well, if that's how sin works, could we just flip that around? And then I realized, yeah, it's all over the scripture, i just never seen it before, where you set your affections on the things above, as Colossians 3 said, and you keep that in the front of your mind, and you imagine yourself doing what's right, and then you embrace that and take it as an action, and then it becomes part of your life, and it gives you an abundant life now, and a uh, dominion of the future age to come as well. So visualization, okay, a little meddling with your life. You know, what is it that you spend your time visualizing? What is it that you let into your eye gate 
uh, you know, what, what do you put before you? What do you pour over? Um, is it the scriptures or is it stuff that is out of Satan's world? Um, and the more time you spend visualizing yourself, enjoying the benefits of following Satan's way, the more likely you will be to follow Satan's way. Conversely, the more time you spend visualizing uh, what you need to do and what the benefits will be of um, following God's way, the more you'll do God's way. In Colossians 3, you know, put to death the seeds of the flesh, set your affections on things above. Um, you got to put to death the deeds of the flesh in order to basically set your affections on things above because the things we do have an emotional, physiological, visceral control over us. So you got to stop the old in order to start the new. Um, so I talk about that a little more in Ain't Gonna Rain No More on uh, sin not reigning in their lives as believers. Uh, then they said they uh, visualizing this, this new thing, they talk about goals. Uh, so that they like um, because they have a written place to go back to to remind me what I put off, what the result of transformed values should look like, as well as the biblical motivation behind it. The biblical Holy Spirit motivation behind these new things. Uh, if you do, um, and you need a reminder, write them down so you can know what you thought, why you thought that, and you don't go like a dog back to its vomit, repeating the same mistakes over and over and over again. I remember when I first started uh, trying to figure out, you know, how do you help people become holy? I asked myself the question, why do people sin? You know, they supposedly have this Holy Spirit within them. You know, what, what's wrong? Why, why, why don't they do what's right? Because so you look in the New Testament, and like, they hear the message and they believe it. Well, why doesn't that happen today? Well, we don't do miracles today, so maybe we don't have the added uh, excitement. But um, it's because we um, forget what we've done. The reason we sin is um, we have bad habits that are so deeply ingrained. Uh, th things that you know we get excited about put these emotional hooks in our brain to all different pleasure centers and we've got to disentangle them and uh, it's very easy to forget unless we can review it um, so unless you have a really really good memory you should have stuff written down so you can review it and this is what this person's done it's great okay so that um, was just awesome that process it's great because it's a member of the body building the body. They had a relationship with the person uh, in the situation. Other people were involved. The person kind of came up, became aware of stuff that was actually hindering their relationship with God and their relationship with others. They grabbed the bull by the horns. They took this step of actions and they basically did it in a biblical way that uh, if if anything is going to work, that's going to work. Um, you know, it's got all the pieces that's in there. Uh, so, I mean, there's some accountability built in as well. Uh, and I think by going public with what they were doing, that happened. Um, so I think that they're definitely on the road to happily ever after. Here's another one from another person. How they grew. Getting deeper in destroying the influence of my family's secular values. Um, so, <laughs> this is going to sound really bad. Don't quote me on this, but it is kind of true. Uh, the things that mess up most people are their families and their churches. Uh, they're, they're not taught truth in churches, and they're, they're not taught God's values in even Christian families. Uh, Christians exist on an oral tradition, just like the Jews. And Jesus said, in vain do you worship me because you teach us the commands of God, uh, the commandments of men. So you need an accurate understanding of the scripture, and then you're going to see it's going to conflict with what you've heard and what you've been taught. But the big issue is, what does the scripture say? So this person in their growth recognized that uh, the thing, one of the things that was holding them back in their relationship with God is that their family had secular values and I, i'd heard some of these values and i totally agree secular is uh, a word that's used to define non-holy so there's the um holy and there's the profane the secular stuff 
and the secular means of the world. Now, this world is not our father's world, despite what the song says. This is Satan's world. He walks about post-cross as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And you need to resist him firm in the faith, the belief system that does that with the word of God. Um, so First uh, John 5, very last verse says, the whole world is under the sway of the evil one. Ephesians 2 says, Prince, Ephesians 6, uh, oh, it's actually 2 as well. There's, there's a spirit at work uh, in the sons of disobedience. He's the prince of the power of the air. And Ephesians 6 says, he's the guy that we wrestle against. Not flesh and blood, but the spiritual powers in high places. This is Satan's world. He told Jesus, this is my world. And I can give it to whomever I want. I'll give it to you if you just kind of you know, bend your knee a little bit. And uh, Jesus said, no way, Jose. Um, he's not going to do it. So you really need to evaluate when you evaluate why you do what you do, you'll find poor values. And then if you ask yourself, where do we get those bad values? It's because it was modeled for you. It was taught you in your very formative age. I, I read somebody from the psychological realm this week, and he said, uh, everything we learned is occurs by age five. And then we go on automatic pilot. Just think about that. Up until age five. You know, five, you actually have, what, what have you learned? You've, all you've learned usually how to speak, um, how to act, um, what to value. Um, you know, it's amazing that so much can be learned at that time. And uh, there's a guy called Bill Gothard who worked with uh, young with te teens and then adults. And he realized that they basically had the problems in not following God based on stuff from their youth and what they thought about themselves and where did it all that come from? People's self-worth and its values all come from their parents and um, not all parents are biblical and godly. And even when they are, things don't always work out. So they grew deeper in destroying the influence of Satan's values, uh, which God continues to challenge me to excavate. So this person in their time with God, as they think about their life, search me, O God, and try my heart, see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way of life everlasting. God challenges them. They bring to their mind things that they need to uh, excavate. And I love that term. You have to go on an archaeological expedition because they're buried deep. And you need to get down there and get rid of them. And then practically, I shifted my focus on external appearance and possessions uh, to focus on righteousness and God's value of me irregardless of what my family says to me so when you try to walk in the light those who are in the dark are going to try to pull you back because you make them feel bad about themselves and uh in our interactions with family and you know friends you know, body members even you have to continually forgive them for not meeting your expectations or seeming to value me uh, your parents do value you probably uh, although there are some cases where they don't, um, but uh, they are not going to be expressing that. The basic job of parenting is to help your child uh, compete, you know, basically the currency of what you need to succeed in this world, compensate for the fact that you're not going to be competent in everything. So you compensate by d developing the unique abilities of each kid so they can you know, basically have a sense of worth and value that, hey, I do this well. Um, and then you celebrate their achievements. Uh, I, I know, particularly in Asian families, this is not a thing. Uh, <laughs> you don't want to celebrate the achievements because then they'll get proud or something like that. So you, you, you keep them you know, down so they will be dependent on you for worth and value, and you never give it to them. It's also a trait in Western uh, firstborns. Uh, parents are never really sure uh, how to handle this new life that came into them. So they are uh, a little hesitant to affirm the value thinking, well, maybe they could do better. And then you know, firstborns become overachievers because they never really got their parents' affirmation. Um, and that's also true in Asian cultures. Um, so it, it takes them a while to figure out, yeah, I can be pleasing in God's sight because of doing the things that God has put before me uh, and drawing their worth and value from that. Uh, drawing your worth and value from just the fact that Jesus died for your sins is doesn't hack it, um, just being created in God's image, doesn't hack it, uh, because if you look at you know, a little deeper, God sends people he created in his image 
to an eternity that's separated from him. And he died for everybody's sins. So I don't really feel that special. Um, we, we want something that's unique. And we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We are knit together. He has good works that he's planned for us to do when he knit us together. Ephesians 2.10. So figuring out what that stuff is and doing the things that please him is really the basis of your worth and value, which enables you to not really care about what others think and be enslaved to that all of your life. Uh, to basically d destroy the influence, you have to kind of separate from it. So uh, what they did is they reduced the interaction of negative things, whatever is negative, spend less time on it. Be it TV, video games, bad friends, or family members that want to pull you down. And then spending quality time in the Word by examining their values. Right? Uh, focusing on ministry and talking to body members has really helped. Yeah, God designed the body to speak truth and love to each other, to help each other grow, and that's the model. And if you think about what normally happens you know, in most in church interactions, the only thing you say is good morning or good, good you know, and then goodbye. <laughs> you don't really, when you gather, you don't have the time of interacting. First uh, Corinthians 14 says, when you come together, everybody has something to build up the other guy, and then there has got to be a spot to do that. So uh, our praise time does that, but we specifically set aside our edification time to make that happen. Um, and of course, uh, they focused on ministry. Uh, it reinforces the right values, because if you're passing it on, you buy them more deeply yourself. And now a word from our sponsor. Of course, Daily Truth Base, I feel much stronger to establish the right thoughts and values. So a Daily Truth Base was written to help you understand God's word, uh, figure out how it applies, and gain a biblical view of God, yourself, and the interaction between the two. If you look at the bottom of each post, it's got, you know, build a God, build a Jesus. Uh, what does God expect of you? Uh, and then you have a biblical worldview rather than a secular satanic worldview. Okay, here's another one. Um, how, they, how did I grow this, this past year? Uh, recognizing that resisting, doubting, feeling overwhelmed and down all demonstrate a lack of humility. Really? I'm resisting things? I doubt God? I feel overwhelmed and down? That's a lack of humility? Hmm, how does that work? Because I'm not trusting that God knows what he's doing in allowing the people, circumstances, and timing of my life that I don't prefer. Wow, that is really insightful. So humility is not the, oh, I'm such a worm. Uh, humility, is, I think, is best his, biblical humility is best typified by Jesus, um, who clearly was not, Milk toast and dealing with pronouncing the woes on the Pharisees and calling them names and saying other nice things, not nice things about them in uh, Matthew 23. But it's saying, not my will, but thine be done. That's that simple. Not doing your will, but doing God's will. So how is it a lack of humility in not trusting God? Well, if we really believe God is sovereign, uh, he allows the circumstances into our life according to his grand plan and is working them together in a plan that blesses me, blesses others, and glorifies himself, which is also blessing him. And we don't always see that because we're not God. So when you don't see something that is said, then that's where faith comes in. That's what trust comes in. If you could see it, it wouldn't be faith. Right, so look again at Hebrews 11, particularly if you look at the write up on Daily Truth Base. Uh, you, you don't see that stuff, but you believe that God is who He said He is and will do what He said He'll do. And he, with those people, He says, I am really pleased. And He pops them in His Hall of Fame of Faith. So when these circumstances come into your life that you hate, you would certainly never choose for yourself or don't meet your preference. Um, realize that. God knows what he's doing. He's allowed this for your benefit. Um, and then you need to figure out, how is it for my benefit? How is becoming a martyr and being fed to the lions for my benefit? Tell me that. Okay, I'll tell you that. <laughs> when things don't work out in this life, they work out in the next life. You get rewarded for it. You, God makes everything up to you. But I don't see that. 
Yeah, that's why you have to have faith in what God has revealed. It's an act of faith. That's where really the faith comes to to the fore. And uh, yeah, do, do, do you think God doesn't know what he's doing? Is he up there in heaven saying, oh, no, Gabriel, how did this happen? No, he allows it. Uh, go back to the book of Job. It's it's like the oldest book. And uh, what, what's the message there? God allows difficulties into our life to glorify himself. And he glorifies those who glorify him. Oh, I don't care about glory. I just want to be in heaven. Well, yeah, then you'll miss out on it. And then you'll spend it long, long time. I think it's called eternity regretting that. So, um, great insight on that one. Uh, you don't have to feel down, doubt, overwhelmed, or irritated. It's like, okay, bring it on. Uh, I know I learned this from something at Daily Truth Base. Being quick to let go of my own perspective has helped me grow in God's perspective and focus on righteousness. So we are not... You know, would you clarify, uh, what or categorize yourself as someone who is quick to change? Hmm. No. Oh, why not? Because I think I'm doing okay. Or because I don't trust that this new thing is right. Well, if you don't trust that it's right, make sure, you know, study. Be a noble-minded Berean. Search the scriptures. See if these things are so. Um, wisdom from above is easily entreated, says James. I think it's chapter 3. Uh, wisdom from below, which is Satan's wisdom, is self-seeking, doesn't let go, it keeps plowing ahead. So uh, let go of your own perspective, hold that as well as other things with an open hand so you don't get your fingers burned by holding on to something that you shouldn't be holding on to. And then focus on righteousness. What's righteousness? Doing what's right in God's sight. Yeah, you get some righteousness from Jesus dying for your sins. But there's so much more of righteousness that God wants. In the nation of Israel, when he demanded righteousness, it wasn't, you, you guys have to believe that Jesus died for your sins. That, that hadn't happened yet. So being right in God's sight. Uh, well, there's some Psalms that says, you know, am I not right with God? We should be able to say that. Not perfect, but we're working on being, doing what's right in his sight. You don't have to do it perfectly. Uh, I'm learning to choose what's right over my preference. It's a choice. Love is a choice. Loyalty is a choice. Doing what's right is a choice. You decide. You have free will. You can decide wrong or incorrectly. So choose what's right over my preference. That includes seeking first the kingdom of God when filtering through my to-do list. That's a thing. Wow, look at that. You got a to-do list, stuff you got to do, and then when you filter it through from God's perspective, things might change, and then it should become stuff you want to do. I admit, I got to do this. I don't like doing this. But if it becomes God's will, then my response should be, I want to do that because it's what's right in God's sight, and he'll bless me. And you saw in some of the praises that God gives power assist. He gives you help and grace to do his will. Grace is power to do God's will. But to do that, Whenever you set priorities, you have to learn to let some perfectly good things be undone. Well, if you've kind of really sought to do God's will and you haven't squandered the resource of time that he's given you, then you can kind of conclude at the end of the day that I've done what God wanted me to do. There wasn't other stuff that I could have done. Um, my definition of time, it's the interval during which we get blessed or cursed. So you got this interval of time. Did you do stuff that gets you blessed or cursed? And cursed is basically, it's the word for diminished, like the flood receding from the ark. And uh, it's to diminish something. So you basically are building yourself or diminishing yourself. Um, and if you basically seek to do God's good, acceptable, and perfect will, there ain't nothing better than that. Uh, but what do you have to do to re receive its perfect will? Um Number one, present yourself to God. This is in Romans 12 on Daily Truth Base. Uh, then, it's also Romans 12 in the scripture. <laughs> you have to not be conformed to this world. So put yourself on the altar, die to self, then refuse to do uh, what the world does. And a little 
question. That's just not a phrase. You might need to specify what is it that you are putting off, like the example we had up above. Then you're transformed, metamorphosized by the renewal of your mind. You go from being a caterpillar to a butterfly. Uh, and then you uh, experience, manifest, demonstrate God's good, pleasing, acceptable, and perfect will in your life. That's the model of a Christian life. By the way, uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2, I was really pleased to see, was the most uh, searched for passage in uh, one of the major Bible apps. I think it was uh, Uversion. They published something on that. Okay, let's see what other member of the body says. Um, well, while I have a faithful, full of faith and believing God, I want to do what he said, willingness loyalty and desire to go wherever God leads. Let's just stop right there. Do you have a faithful willingness, loyalty and desire to go wherever God leads? Uh, I have that if he leads me to a spot where I want to go. Yeah, if he, if he, see, he says what I want, then I'm all for it. What if he doesn't? What if the path to the still waters, to the banquet table, leads through the valley of death? Hmm. It's a Psalm 1 for you, those who miss the imagery. This year has tested Psalm 11. It's the first Psalm I had to do in my Hebrews course. And it, the theme of that is God test the righteous. And it's particularly applicable for times like this when the whole social order gets turned upside down. And uh, it's one of the, there's a figure of speech called deliberate ambiguity. <clears throat> and that's where one of the, times and this is people say this when they can't figure it out but this in this passage it's it's one of the few spots where it's really exact the author says uh, the Lord test tries refines purifies the righteous you're righteous you're doing what's right in God's sight you will be tested in fact to get there you had to be tested and the imagery there is of a refiner of metal and uh, they take the ore, and they, which has you know other, other it's a mixture of things, they put it in the pot, they put the fire under it, the impurities rise to the top, they skim it off, and then they do it again, and then they do it again, until it gets pure. So, how does the metallurgist know when the stuff is pure? It's when they bend over the pot and they look in and they see their face reflected. Okay, and then they know it's like a mirror. The silver on the back of your mirror has been purified, or whatever it is they're using on the back of mirrors. And uh, then the next phrase that at the end says, uh, depending on your version, his face doth behold the upright. So that means uh, the upright will behold his face. It's a different translation. So two things going on there. God's face is his favor. Whenever we talk about appearing before God's face, try putting in favor and it fits. Like if you Esther saw the king's favor when she beheld his face. And he says, oh, stand up. Yeah. Look. Uh, normally you have to keep kowtowed down. So uh, the uh, righteous gets tested and God grants favor to them. It's just like into Psalm 1. And then the other one is the upright behold his face. The pure in heart are the ones who see God. And I believe the psalmist <clears throat> meant both of those things. You see God's favor. He sees you. Life is good after you go through the refiner's fire. <clears throat> Except that's not a one-time deal. It happens repeatedly. So the answer is how bright do you want to shine? <clears throat> so I have a faithful willingness, loyalty, and a desire to go where God does, uh, leads. This year has tested the follow-through. talked about that earlier on what is required to fully obey and fully follow. Um, one of the things I listen to in the morning uh, is this daily devotional thing that my Amanda's flash briefing gives me. <clears throat> and the majority of the time, they're really bad. Uh, this one, they just every Sunday, they switch. And today, they did a, a real classic called Streams in the Desert. And it's kind of old-time religion. And uh, it starts out with, uh, delayed obedience is not obedience. Wow. Yeah, that's true. I remember with our kids, uh, the mantra eventually uh, was, uh, 
you need to obey right away, all the way, and with a happy spirit. Um, right away, all the way, with a happy spirit. And uh, if late obedience, it's better than no obedience, but it's once you understand that this is what God wants, uh, then you need to fully obey and fully follow. The sermon if you want to know about fully following Caleb, um, whole, wholehearted believer, fully followed the Lord and therefore got blessed. And he is actually highlighted above Joshua, the two spies who went into Kadesh Barnea and saw the blessings God wanted to give them and saw God rather than the giants that were standing in the way. So it's tested the follow through of what is required to fully follow and fully obey. And in the process, growing in grace, and I understand that it's power to go wherever God leaves. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Also, no matter how hard it is, God will never want you to do something unless he gives you the power to do it. My God will supply all your need according to riches of glory in Christ Jesus. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Out of Philippians 4. And then the verse that challenged them on this, Joshua left nothing undone in all that Moses has commanded him, or which God had commanded Moses to tell him. I don't know if that will ever be said of our lives. Unfortunately, I don't think it's going to be said of mine, but um, I'm working on it. This year has called for greater increase in dependence going into the unknown. I mentioned this a couple times, but uh, one of the campus ministries put together a survival pack, which is a bunch of books they got from a Christian publisher. And it was a little paperback, which I really didn't understand because I was a pretty young believer. But the title I got, and it ministered to me, and it continues to, it said, Abraham went out, in King James Version, not knowing whither. So God called Abraham to go out, Genesis 12, to a place he would show him. And the next verse says, and Abraham went out, not knowing whither. Um, oh, a little later, it was at chapter 22. God tells Abraham, uh, Abe, sacrifice your son. Yeah, the one I gave you and promised uh, you'd have descendants from. Yeah, I want you to kill him. And the very next morning, Abraham backs up, saddles up his donkey, takes his son, and goes to worship God. He's showing that God is worthy of the response. And that's where I got my <clears throat> worship as a response to Revelation. God called him to do it. He did it. Even though it looked like it contradicted something else, something in the um, devotional this morning was also, it says, uh, we need to give up on the question why. Yeah, you don't want to be stupid. But it's just like, well, I need to understand this better. I, I don't know if I can trust God on this. I'm not sure if this is what he really wants me to do. That one, that last one, I'm not sure if he really wants me to do. Yeah, that's legitimate. You need to understand how to figure out the will of God. And when you figure that out, there's actually a thing on daily uh, uh, toil, time of your life on truthbase.net. as the funnel of, there's probably a sermon on it too. Once you understand it, you got to do it. Um, even though it doesn't look reasonable. But you're very clear that the voice that told you you were going to have the son also told you to sacrifice the son. In Abraham's case, that's how he knew. And then Romans tells us he reckoned the resurrection. That's unbelievable. He figured out that there would be a resurrection, and he never heard of the Easter bunny. He didn't know about Easter. That didn't happen until Jesus. Um, so, you know, it's like, what a great faith. God said this, and I know if I kill him... Uh, I'm still going to have kids through him because God promised I would have kids through him. And then, unbelievable. That's why he's, you know, one of the reasons he's the father of faith. He obeyed God right away. So, obedience requires dependence on God to make the things happen. Uh, interdependence with other members of the body. Uh, Self-denial. Pick up your cross daily. You can't follow Jesus without dying to yourself every day. It does say every day. And service according to God's priorities. I am seeking, as we all should be, to grow and be spirit-led in those areas. Amen. May your tribe increase. Okay. I've grown in delighting in God alone as things change. Yeah, the things that we get comfortable with, they change. Yeah. God gives and God takes away. Indian giver be the name of the Lord. <laughs> Oops, I realize that's now considered culturally inappropriate. <laughs> uh, but... Uh, 
you know, colonial promiser be the name of the Lord, if you want to take it from the other perspective. That's Job, by the way. God gives and God takes away in his perfect plan and timing. And to be able to embrace the loss as God's perfect plan uh, is really a mark of maturity. Uh, to be able to rejoice when they beat you for sharing your faith, as uh, Peter and John did, or Paul and Silas did in prison. Um, that really requires faith. It, if you have, like Job, you lose everything and you still say, blessed be the name of the Lord, um, and know that he is eventually going to set things right and you'll stand, um, you'll come forth as gold. Uh, that requires a real belief in what God has revealed as opposed to what you can see or what the world says. I believe I've continued to seek and embrace his priorities, responding to the spirit and examining and rooting out bad values. Okay, this is something you need to get hold of. The spirit of God is the spirit of truth, and he guides in truth. His job is to convict of sin, righteousness, and judgment and guide in truth. That was to an original audience, but it it's what he does in the lives of believers now as he causes us to will and to do God's good pleasure. So you got to be sensitive to the spirit. And if you ignore him for years, you get a callous when he's trying to get you to, you know, get, get rid of the bad and embrace the new. And you don't respond. Your ability to hear him, to have him guide you, diminishes. But as you repent and you want to move in the right direction, God, you know, wants you to wants us to obey him he seeks us to worship him in spirit and truth he, he his eyes run to and throw throughout the earth seeking just who can i show myself strong on behalf of those who are blessable there's a sermon on that too um so you got to kind of uh since you live by the spirit says galatians 5 you know, keep in step with him walk close to him have him guide your steps all, all those pa passages in psalms and proverbs about guidance it's the, the spirit in, in our life doing that uh, and examining and rooting out bad values that are going to trip you up, which every follower must do, even if it takes a minute, a month, a decade to get there. It's better late than never. It is never, ever, ever too late to do the right thing. Oh, I've lived this way for so long, I might as well just continue to the end. No, you know, if God has brought to mind something he wants you to do, obey all the, right away, all the way, happy spirit. And even if you do it imperfectly, it's better to do the right thing poorly than the wrong thing perfectly. Oh, here's another quote from our sponsor. God requires exact obedience. And that exact obedience magnifies him as the priority of our lives. You know, why do I have to wear my sideburns a certain way or my, my cut them? Or why do I have to put on tassels? Or why do I have to not eat? You know, ham and cheese sandwich. You know, what, what, well, you could actually eat the cheese sandwich. Um, why no pork chops? Why, why no barbecued ribs? <laughs> no, no pork. Ah, we just wiped out a billion people. Um, because God wants a separate holy people. Holy means separate or distinct. And that's one of the things that made the Jews distinct from others. Uh, what makes you distinct from others in the New Testament times? Uh, if you... You show that he is the priority of your life. You actually show that he is worthy of being obeyed and you make him larger than this life through your obedience. Uh, this little series I did on Malachi um, where I entitled it Lord of the Leftovers. And God does not like being given the leftovers of our lives. And as a result, he doesn't bless those who make him Lord of the Leftovers. He says, try giving that, you know, to your governor. Try paying your taxes with that. Not going to work. Okay, uh, I'm out of time. Um, usually I pause for more questions, but since this is mainly your stuff, and any question that you need uh, to get answered before you can sleep tonight? Okay, then let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we bow before you acknowledging that we are not self-caused, that you have made us, you've made us for a purpose, that purpose is good, you revealed that purpose to us, uh, and it is the best way to live this life and the next. Thank you for your goodness, thank you for sharing your divine nature with us, by putting your spirit within us. Thank you that you call us to be partakers of your divine nature, as Second Peter says, we add things to our faith. 
Thank you that you want us to have a rich welcome into your kingdom. Uh, thank you that you want us to be fruitful here on earth. And if these are things you want to have happen, you surely give us all the grace that we need to do it. Thank you for the examples, uh, not just in the scripture, but in our body of people who are pilgrims going through this life, recognizing that it's not their final destination, but they're headed to uh, basically a heavenly city uh, in which dwells righteousness. Just like Abraham and his family members were looking for, you know, his fellow compatriots in the Hall of Fame, were looking for a city who had foundations, whose builder and maker was God. So we too confess that we really are just strangers and pilgrims on this earth. So show us where we are getting too settled down like everyone else. Uh, show us where we are living with the wrong values. We kind of bought into Satan's lies and obviously we don't see it because we're deceived and he's a master at doing that. And uh, help us you know, walk in the light as you are in the light. Uh, thank you that promises of fellowship with you and with like-minded believers as we do that. Thanks for your word. Thanks for this time. We pray you bless the rest of our day in Christ's name for his glory. Amen.